welcome back. We have a very deadly episode today uh, with Winter Austin. Winter, how are you? I'm doing good. Great. So thanks for doing this. I know we've kind of done back and forth with the scheduling stuff. I had some issues and, and you know, finally got yep. you on. And now, yep. hopefully, there's some thunderstorms rolling through here shortly. So I'm like, okay, just wait 45 minutes, if you would, please, <laughs> and, and let's get this done. Yeah, sounds good to me too. We we got dark over here a lot faster than I was expecting. I was hoping to get the last of the sunset before, but it's gone. There's clouds out there. Well, today, We're supposed to get rain tonight. Oh, today's forecast was um, it was heavy thunderstorms and rain all day, and I had like back to back to back podcasts recording like all day. And I was like, of course, the day that I load my schedule up, the weather's not gonna you know play along, and it's either gonna be too noisy. And it's going to pick up on the microphone or it's going to knock my internet out one or the other. So I was like, oh, but so far it's been good. So hopefully in the next 45 minutes or so, we're, we're just fine. Okay. So let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about yourself before we get started. We were talking off the air about, um, you know, some of your military connections and kind of how you uh, have a background. But like, who is Winter Austin? Uh, Winter Austin is a conglomeration of... Uh, my name and how I got my name um, in the first place. So found out uh, my mom wanted to name me Winter and it was based off of a, a soap opera character that I found out just about a year ago that it was a mystery type of uh, soap opera called Edge of Night. And the character I was named after was a murderess. So I'm just like how fortuitous that I end up starting to write, you know, you know, mysteries and murder mysteries and crime fiction too. So uh, that's where that name came from. I was back in the late aughts. Um, I was switching from one type of. Um, so I used to write in the Christian. Um, what do you want to call it? Industry. Christian publishing industry never could get cut published because my stuff was just too gritty and too in your face mm -hmm. and they didn't like it. So my agent at the time decided we were going to switch over to the um, traditional market. And in doing that, I needed to change my name from using my real name to using a pen name. And uh, my husband was working for a national guard base at the time. And I would go out occasionally and work out with him and the guys that he had deployed with. And we were discussing what I should change my name to. Well, I was told I had to keep winter. So I had to come up with something different for the last name. And so I was throwing names around and he was like, mm, nope, he was shooting them down left and right. And I said, well, what about the name that I was named after? And there it came. So winter Austin it was, but I found out that the winter Austin that I was named after her last name is spelled like the Jane Austin instead of, you know, like Austin, Austin, Texas. So, mm -hmm. which is what I use, but eh, too, who cares? So <laughs> I don't want that misconception. Uh, that then, you know, that's who I am. So I have a long history in agriculture because I grew up a farm girl and uh, it, Top Gun was probably my foray into the military <laughs> and deciding, you know, at first I was like, oh, I was going to join myself. And then nah, after time, no. And then I thought I would be a police officer. Yeah, I kind of wanted my holiday. So that was yeah. my whole reason for turning out down being a cop. I wanted to have my holidays. And then my junior year in high school, I met my husband and he had just returned from um, AIT. He was like two weeks back when we met. And that's how I got connected even more. Found out he was uh, drilling with a former classmate of mine who was good friend who I was good friends with. So uh, we spent a lot of time together. But that was how I got into the military um, on that side. But we do have a long-standing history in our family of people serving in the military. I had an aunt who married a um, an officer in the army, and they bounced all over the world and I had an uncle who was in the Navy who just retired uh, two, three years ago. So um, yeah, so pretty much strong connection. I had a co the cousin 
whose dad was a military officer in the army, he went into the army too. And both he and my husband were deployed at the same time, not in the same area, but both yeah. of them were in Iraq. So wow. he was an engineer and my husband worked for, he was with based with a maintenance unit. So he was the quartermaster for the maintenance unit. Okay. Yeah. It's a small world. Sometimes you don't, don't yeah. realize who you're going to run into and where you're going to run into them at. And it's just kind of yeah. surprising. And so and now um, an empty nester, but our oldest son, we had twins right off the bat and our oldest one uh, followed dad and went into the military himself. And uh, he's always had a fascination with the macabre, but we'll see. He's uh, he had to take a class um, like, you know, there's your basic first aid in field first aid. And then they wanted him to take a class where he's a step up, mm -hmm. but not like a medic. Well, doing that, he's like, man, I really like this medic stuff. So he told them that if I'm re-enlisting, I want to go regular army because I want to be a combat medic. So they're supposed to be switching him over to that. Nice. But we've been, we've been in the military long enough to know that it isn't going to happen right away. So no, no, no. Hurry waiting. Away is, yeah. a, is a model yeah. for a reason. And yeah, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of that. Those, those types of, uh, cliches are used a lot around the house when the kids were little and even still afterwards. So oh, yeah. we still we use them and people are like, what did you just say? And I'm like, you got to understand. So, yeah. 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 You just don't know. I remember, uh, remember when I was in, I did some medical stuff as well. Um, I worked with some combat medics. I wasn't a medic myself. I was in a medical field, but I worked logistics, but, um, the air force at one point in time said, well, a medic's a medic you all have to go through the same training. I was like, I'm the last person that needs to be working on anybody. Like if things have gone wrong and you're calling me in to help out, like you're in a lot of trouble, like, yeah, not the greatest idea, but I did work with some really good combat medics, uh, in the army and man, those guys knew stuff, you know, better than anybody else I knew. Yeah. My son has been always been interested in that. And I kind of so. probably can attribute part of his interest in it to me because we would watch, I mean, even from an early age. Okay. So when they were a year old, we, my husband was finishing at college and we would watch reruns of MASH. <laughs> and as soon as the theme song came on, if he and his brother were playing in the living room, they would stop everything they were doing, watch the TV until the end of the theme song. And then once they went right into like commercials or whatever, however they had it set up, they go back to playing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, and you know, they all grew up watching that stuff. They watched a lot of crime uh, shows because that was, that's my interest. And, you know, he's one of his 4-H projects slash science fair projects <laughs> was to show the different stippling from buckshot, birdshot, you know, all this stuff totally grossed out as 4-H leader, but a science fair teacher was so fascinated. They just took a deer carcass of uh, what they couldn't use for me. And he and his dad went out and did some shooting on it, took pictures and talked about it. And I remember my kitchen table being completely covered in shotgun shells and bird shot and deer, sh you know, everything just all over. And then all the lead and all the black powder. And I'm like, uh, so I just would walk away. <laughs> That's so, an awesome science project. I like that. Yeah, it was. He did really well in a science fair project, but I still laugh to this day at how much he grossed out his 4-H leader because he did that for his his 4-H talk. So, but I knew he he he's always going to be interested in that, and he's kicked around the idea of being a um, mortician too because that's a dying breed. You know, yeah. all everybody around in our uh, area is dying breed. <laughs> I, was, I didn't catch that that's a good catch <laughs> but he, uh, Put the so, in would you stop <laughs> so he he's also looking at that he hasn't quite finished his um college education and he he's one he's the indecisive one which is something i believe he picked up from his dad uh he's he started out in the criminal justice program um decided you know right when he's doing that that's when the world <laughs> american general 
decided we don't like cops. Yeah. You know, and then he's like, "Mm, do I really want to put my life on the line for people who hate me? And, you know, he changed his mind. I always figured he'd go into the forensic fields because he's very been very science minded. Um, And he's still kind of carrying over that. I told him if you do become a mortician, there's always a chance that you could become a coroner if you go to the right area Mm -hmm. because they'll need it. And most of the time it's morticians that get asked to be. You know, you get voted into being a corner. Yeah, so got the experience and the skills. Yeah. But he's he's always leaned very heavily towards the military. Um some of the stuff, you know, with the changes. He hit his class was probably the last class to graduate basic training where the drill sergeants could actually be mean to them, if you want to say that. And uh, now he's like, Yeah, so uh when we still some of my husband's uh, buddies that he deployed with they're still in and they're full time and we talk with them and they're like the the military we remember is not the military that we're dealing with right now it's so different. yeah my son graduated from basic training uh about three years ago now and uh he, i remember him telling me about it we couldn't go down there and watch him graduate because of covid but um I just remember him telling me about it and I was like, yeah, we get a, like a water break, like every hour. And I was like, a water break. Like what do you mean <laughs> yeah. like a water break? Like you'd sit there and drink out of your canteen. He's like, Oh no, we didn't have canteens. We we'd have like camelbacks that we could drink out of. But most of the time we just went to the water fountain. I was like, water fountain. It's like, you got to go drink out of the water fountain. The water fountain that I had in my barracks, we weren't allowed to drink out of. Like the chrome had to be polished like perfectly, no water spots and all that. Like we had a water fountain, but we didn't even know if it worked. <laughs> like it was, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was for looks, you know, like we filled up our canteen out of the faucet in the sink. Like nobody was going to drink out of that water fountain. I was like, you, you got water breaks? Like, and he just told me all these different things. And I was like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Much I different don't... than when I was in. Yeah, he did tell me. So I coach volleyball for many years and I was very up to date on, um, you know, developing bodies and how to do weightlift training and all this type of stuff with them. And I remember how abused my husband's body was with the type of training that they had to go through when they went through basic training and AIT and even afterwards. And so my son was telling us about the types of, um, what they were doing during basic training. And I'm going, wow, they finally got it right. And then they turned around three years later and changed it all up again. And it's like, you know, so I was like, well, maybe you'll be okay. You know, your, your joints won't be completely destroyed by the time you turn 25, you know, (laughs) you won't have back problems and stuff, but I, you know, it's, it's military is meant for the young group and that, you know, they, they, break them down to build them up and be able to do what they need to do. So yeah, it's I don't not know. easy He's... to grow old in the military. That's for sure. No, it's not. That's part of the reason why my husband finally decided when his 20 years was coming up, he's like, I got, it. I got it. I mean, yeah. he even had, he got the condition where when he did his physical fitness test, he could walk and it still was, Oh yeah. He, He couldn't even meet the requirements because ah. his body was so broken down, <laughs> but you know, he he had enough we were we bounced back and forth a lot though we weren't a regular army type of family uh our first years of marriage almost felt like it because we went from one he went from one unit to another unit he had just transferred out of his the unit that he started in into a unit in cedar rapids iowa that um and then 9 11 happened Mm. And so he was with them for about a year and we moved to Kansas. So he transferred units into Kansas. We were there for a while. We moved back to Iowa. He stayed with the Kansas unit while we were living in Iowa for a while. And by then I had our fourth child and he did with Kansas. He did a stint. Is it Kansas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He did a stint in Germany with Kansas. And then when I was pregnant with our fourth son, then they went to, no, 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 no. Hold up, backtrack. When I was pregnant with our daughter, he went to Italy. And the day that he came home was the day she decided she was going to be born. 
Perfect. So he missed her. Yeah, she he missed her birth like half an hour. Wow. He almost hit a deer on his way to come see his daughter too. Um, and then when I was pregnant with our fourth our fourth kid, our final son, um, he went to Germany. So he did a couple of um, overseas, you know, type of things. And I got to hear about all the the fun stuff that they did. And you know, he brought back some wine from Italy. He brought back some beer from germany you know and nice. those type of things we still have a bottle of wine that i've told i cannot open until our 25th wedding anniversary well that's two years away <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know how good it'll be it's though it's worth the hype <laughs> yeah <laughs> so after kansas um we moved to illinois he transferred to an illinois unit and that unit that he was with was the unit that he deployed with awesome. and yeah and that was middle of the aughts. So that was 06, 07. I was living in a town. I had no clue who anybody was. I had four children all under the age of eight. And um, here, you know, our family was like four hours away. And so I was on my own, but may do. I mean, that an, another aspect of our oldest son is that he ended up learning how to be at eight years old, the man of the house. Yeah. And you know, the military kids are a different breed of kids mm -hmm. and you can pick them out real fast. If yes. you go somewhere, you can tell that they grew up with somebody, both or one of their parents were in the military. They just, they know what's what and everything. So all like all of our kids were, um, brought up with that. So they were used to it. So all their young years, their dad was in the, he was AGR um, for the National Guard. He literally was an accountant on the base. No, technician. technician, sorry. Um, he was uh, an accountant on the base, but he was a quartermaster when he was drilling. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So he was getting out all the stuff. So uh, he, he got tapped a lot which when he came back, he, he did a lot of speaking engagements, which fed into his need to become a teacher and gave him that chance to kind of prepare for that. Uh, he, he liked training the younger soldiers. Um, uh, so it just fed into it, helped him get to where he was. And um, by the time he got his teaching uh, endorsements and everything ready, that's when we moved back to Iowa and he stayed with the Illinois unit for two more years. And then his retirement came up and he decided I'm done. So our boys were in high school, our two older ones were in high school by then. And uh, that's when the oldest one was kind of leaning toward that. So a lot of that, him being connected to that and being around it for so long made, gave me connections. Yeah that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And uh, I remember we came back for a, a party of some sort when we were living in Illinois and the unit that he had started with had deployed to Iraq in the first years that we were in Iraq. And that unit saw a lot of um, combat that they were not prepared for. Mm -hmm. And they had trucks they would drive over IEDs and the trucks would blow up, you know, and then the guys would have to pull bodies out of the mm -hmm. trucks and stuff. And I'm sitting here with my husband and listening to these guys talk about this. And in normal circumstances, they're not going to say these type of things in front of civilians yeah. will not say. It. And for some reason they felt comfortable enough and felt that I was like one of them, even though I didn't serve, I was in a way serving and they would just talk about all kinds of things. So that was my first taste of what PTSD was really like for some guys. And so I did a lot of studying on it and realized, you know, it's not just military only suffering from that. You know, I have, I've had moments where I've had PTS, you know, and it, it and I know what sets it off. Um, but it, so one of the books that I wrote, in fact, I'm going right back through it again because we're uh, one of my publishing houses uh, accepted the uh, decision to re-publish um, it, and it was yeah, it's 
it deals with a female character who at the time that I wrote it, it wasn't a thing, but it, I'm sure by now it is. Um, I made her a Marine recon sniper and, um, she saw things that she couldn't get over and I had her suffering from that PTSD. So well, I had Vietnam vets who read the book that said, it's like I crawled inside their head and pulled out everything that they'd ever experienced. And I'm mean, like, it's, I mean, you can, you can take your own personal experiences. You can listen to people who are already dealing with it and you can do a lot of research. And there was a lot of material out there at the time for me to do. I still have a, um, have it bookmarked. There was an article, I think wall street journal did it on a veteran who was homeless and he suffered from PTSD and it was a very informative article that I liked and I kept it bookmarked. So if I ever needed to go back, I could read through it. So let's but, talk about uh, let's talk about how you got into writing. You know, you got a, a lot of experience in life that has kind of helped mold that. When did you really start saying, you know what, I am going to be a writer. This is going to work. Yeah, uh, when I was very young, in fact. Um, so I, I, I've always said this when um, my mom told me when I was old enough to sit and hold a book on my own, I was reading to myself and I was telling the story. And so I have always been a storyteller and I would, you know, I have a very wild imagination. I can remember even before I started school coming up with things and pretending to do things and talking my sister into, you know, going on some wild adventures out on the farm. And uh, so when I was in fourth grade, uh, we had a chance to be able to write a story and be able to go to a young writers conference. And so the teachers had everybody in the class write it and then they would choose. So they, I think they decided they would pick one boy and one girl from each, you know, the each grade that was allowed to go. And my story was based off of a dream I had. And it was a little mystery of all things. And uh, they chose it and I got to go and going and seeing everything, all this stuff, I was like, I want to be an author. I want to, I want to be a writer. And, uh, there was a, and I met her again here pa this past fall. There's a local author who had done a workshop there and she was a romance author. She started writing romances in the early eighties. And, uh, I told her when I met her again, I said, I think you were at one of my workshops. I couldn't remember if it was my elementary or my high school. Cause I went to that writer's conference twice in my life. And, uh, and I told her just by listening and knowing that you were a local author and you were able to do this. I was in Iowa. I was in a nowheresville, Iowa. I could do it myself. So that led me down the path. I've always I had always been working my way towards that. And when I had my, two oldest sons. My husband was still in college and I was home alone with, you know, two babies. I'm like, I have time. Let's start writing again. Yeah. So I got back into doing it and that was what started the goal to actually, I'm going to make my path towards actual publication. So I learned, but there were many years between that moment and when I actually got published of learning reteaching myself some things that you know had been is it you know outdated and just kind of a path of picking and choosing trying to decide what it was that i was really good at and always realizing i'm always going i can't write a book where i don't kill somebody and i <laughs> i i just What's can't i yeah, have yeah, to you kill, gotta somebody. kill somebody like I gotta everybody, kill somebody. everybody survives that's that's not fun <laughs> so i the one and only um, thing that I got published was a little novella collection. It was just a short, short and sweet type of romancy thing. And I couldn't kill anybody in it. And that was agonizing. It was so agonizing. And then my writing partner at the time said, when I got finished with it, she goes, now go write that book to kill somebody. Yeah. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> but uh, then, and I also realized I can't write a book that doesn't have somebody with a military background or has connections to the military. So there's every book I have written out there, someone 
in that book, a character, whether it be the main character or a supporting character has a military background. And uh, it's most of the time I spend it, they're either Air Force or not Air Force, sorry, Army or uh, Marines. And because those have been most of my connections, but one day I'll move on. I kind of got <laughs> tired of watching. You'll, you'll <laughs> and all these, all these these yeah, we'll get you upgraded yeah. to an Air Force character one of these days. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, my husband. <laughs> it's still, it's an ongoing joke, but he does have an uncle who was in the Air Force. And uh, remember back in 03 when there was a flyby in North Korea? Yeah, his uncle was on that plane. Nice. <laughs> and he goes, the only reason you guys are knowing about this is because it made national news and uh, they gave him the A-OK -okay to say, but... He did some work in the Air Force that was very, 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 very classified. So yeah. my uncle did. Yeah. too. My uncle was in the Air Force a long, 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 long time ago, back when it was just barely the Air Force. And uh, to this day, I don't know what he did. He won't yeah. tell me. He won't even won't discuss. It. He's like, yeah, I was in the Air Force. That's, that's it. That's all I'm going to tell. Yeah. You. It's my uh, it's my husband's mom's brother. And so we all know he retired. Has it been, it's been almost 15 years, I think, since he retired. So, um, but I, I'm not even going to bother picking his brain <laughs> ever because it's like, I'll, I'll be, it'll be, you're not read in on it. I'm like, I don't care. So, yeah, you might but, get more yeah. than you asked for, too. Well, true, true. But uh, unfortunately, he's an Iowa fan and we're Iowa State people. So he always has to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that that's, uh, in fact, I was just um, trying to come up with some new st new material for my one series. And I'm going, you know, I have this plan and I'm going to eventually have to bring it in. So the main character in my um, Benoit and Zanane series, she's the ex-wife of a Delta operative. And he was in the first book, but I was like, I got to bring him back in. And so at some, at some point he's going to come back to Iowa and he and his buddies are going to wreak havoc. So nice. I don't know how that's going to go, but that's also depending on if the publishing house wants that to happen. So, yeah. Sure. Well, let's talk for, let's talk about uh, straight for the kill. Let's talk about okay. that. And um, that's your newest book uh, mm -hmm. in the Benoit and Dane mystery series. Yep. Um, spoiler free synopsis breakdown without giving too much away. Um, okay. So, so there, when you first meet him in the first book, um, Elizabeth, the sheriff, Benoit had mentions the fact, the reason she became a sheriff in the first place, the reason why she has all this knowledge in criminal justice and stuff is because when, uh, like 20 plus years ago, her best friend died under mysterious circumstances. And there was like a big cover up in the County. Um, and so 25 years later on the anniversary of her death and another gal's death, it happens again. And so now we're between her and her deputy detective, Dane, Lila Dane, they have to figure out who is actually doing this, what, what's really going on and how, you know, we end this because in her mind, she's got it that this corrupt sheriff is the person behind all of this but is he really, you know, so that's, it's my little bit of a justified type of thing where you have that Raylan Givens type character, but in this case, it's a female with that, um, Boyd Crowder person in the end and they're always butting heads, but is he really a bad guy or is he really a good guy type of thing? So, um, Chaos ensues like it always does in one of my books. And we find out longtime family secrets come to light and uh, characters who um, were not privy to things now become privy to things that everybody kept hiding. So it's all it's that little small town dynamic of showing that, you know, we're not immune to the type of things that go on in inner cities or bigger cities. These yeah. type of things do happen here and it, it can get pretty ugly. 
so yeah that trying not to spoil it <laughs> yeah, yeah that's yeah. It's hard, that right? it. Yeah. <laughs> yes it is especially you know i i love it though when i'm writing books i have my writing partner and my best friend who are my beta readers and after every chapter or after every scene i send them that and they read that and they're my go-to of keeping enough information away from them they don't want me to tell them what i know is going to happen they want to read it with fresh eyes like a reader would and try to figure out if i can if i give away who the you know who the bad person is too soon or too late so and so far except for the first book um, my best friend made me actually change that because she's like the setup is not right for who you have it needs to be this person and so that got changed but i've kept them all in the dark long enough they've never seen never seen it coming that's the beauty of beta readers is they have an unbiased, you know, kind of view of it when they get that first read and they can kind of tell you like, I didn't like the way that was set up or, or this doesn't make sense. And that's, those are a second set of eyes. You really can't, you can't put a price on because it really helps yeah. fine tune those what, things. Yeah. And what works for me is my writing partner is actually an author herself. So she can take the aspects of the writing part of it. Mm-hmm and do i have the conflict do i have the motivation do i have this this and this and then my best friend is just a very avid reader and she reads in a lot of the same genre that i write in and then she can come back and both of them are, they hold hold no bar when they tell me they will flat out tell me that sucks fix it you know i don't like this and so that's what i want and the best thing about my best friend is that her mindset pretty much aligns with my editor. So then I get that front line before it even gets to my editor. And if there's things that they miss, my editor will catch. And so it's not, by the time she gets the book, there's not as much garbage that she has to go through and fix as it would be if I didn't have them at all. Nice. But I've worked with, worked with her long enough that she understands my mindset. Yeah. And she knows that even by the time she gets it, it's second or third draft, you know, by the time I've gotten it, it's, unless I'm on, <clears> like, <throat> I've pushed my deadlines back and back and back because I've had to. Uh, she knows I've got, I'm still missing something. I'm still missing a motivation here. Why, you know, why are we doing this the way we're doing this? We need to go back. And, and so both she and I had to, kind of reset our brains here because um she typically works in the romance editing but she worked with me and quite a few other authors in the romantic suspense type of stuff and now she's doing a lot of the mystery only and i told her are you ready for this (laughs) because when i signed on with them i'm like we're going in a whole new direction here because i'm gonna kill you yeah and i'm like i'm winging it bad winging it bad here and she's like oh you can do it i can do it too so uh it it works she goes because she's like maybe in in learning how to juggle um the type of conflict so when you're writing romantic suspense you have two different conflicts going on you have the romantic conflict and you have the suspense or mystery conflict in my case i've always had police procedural type stuff that's Mm -hmm. usually what i coin my book says. Um, so I had to work out all that. I spent more time with that than I did the romance. And so that was always pretty flat and we'd have to go and change those things. By the time I figured out how to do the balancing of it, that's when I lost the publishing house that I was with. And I'm like, okay, then let's just start writing military romantic thrillers. And then they're like, "Mm, not for us. I'm like, okay. How about this? And they're like, yeah, we'll take that off of a paragraph and one chapter. I had to create a whole book series. Nice. And and it's been agonizing ever since. I spend more time agonizing over all of those books in my Benoit and Dane series than I have anything else. And it's partly because it's it's new territory for me. Um, And I'm getting better at it. But I'm also having to learn how to place the red herrings properly go back i spend more time writing chapters ahead and then going back because i'm like oh i wrote this i don't have this indication 
in these past chapters. So I have to go back and read through some, as much as I try not to do it, I'm editing at the same time I'm writing, which for me is, it's not fun because that's not how my, how my brain works to be, to be the right kind of writer that I am. So I had, um, where was, oh, I think it was with my, uh, sisters in crime chap, Iowa chapter group. Um, I told people I'm an organic pantser. And a lot of the people were like, I like that better than just being like, you know, pantser. I said, I am. I, I, you know, the characters lead me to where I need to go. And if I, the author intervene and tell them, this is how I want to go. It, I write myself in a corner. And so, and you don't want it to be too predictable. You don't want it to be something that you, you, you mapped out to a point where it's, it's like a script and, and, and the reader can predict it. I hate that in a book. I've, I've read a couple of books that I, I just saw everything coming. There was no, there's yeah. no suspense to that. And, you know, I see the point. It wasn't a bad book, but I mean, uh, it's not that interesting it's a, it's, when you can predict it. Yeah. It's formula is form. I can't say it. It's based off of a formula and I have dropped reading some series because each book, it, I feel like I was, reading you know if it's the new book i was like i'm reading the last book and the book before it you know there's nothing different so i you know i like it when authors can come up with things and that's the my the other thing i struggle with was trying not to repeat something i wrote in another book and then putting in a new book and in fact i was just while I was reading through um the book before i sent it to my editor that i've already had published i was like going I had this scene in one of my newer books. Oh, great. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, at least I changed it enough that it's not exactly the same, but it was, it's like, it's almost the same setup. And I'm going, I'm going to, I got to be careful, but I also know that there are just some things you're going to repeat yourself. Let's just make it as different as you can for whatever book you're writing it in. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's next now that this, this book just came out, right? Yes, it came out the end of January. End of January. So what's next? What else are you working on? Um, so as I said, I'm working on uh, going back through and making some changes to an old series that I'm going to have republished. We're hoping to release it here late spring, but we'll see. It depends on um, publishing schedules and editor schedules and you know cover art schedule and everything like that. And then well, while I'm doing that, I'm working on the third book. Um, that is supposed to go with my publisher in Tergir. This is my Irish publisher, and it's for the the military thriller romance. It's got romance in it, but I've kind of just like thrown it away. I'm spending more time focusing on the thriller aspect of everything, and not as military as, as say like Jack Carr stuff or anything. But that's pretty hard. You know, it's what. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm reading through his books, and I'm going. He's so analytical and detailed and everything. Oh, yeah. and I'm like, but he has that background. I don't. Yeah. And so it's like, I just, I just glean from those or, you know, go back and read some of the Vince Flynn and um, uh, Mitch Rapp series and things like that. And I got into, um, I'm trying to stay away from reading my mystery series that I'm really into because that's going to make me want to work on the next Benoit and Dane book, which I need to back off because I got to get these other ones. Yeah. Uh, the bad part of juggling a full-time job and two publishing houses, you know, I got to pick and choose what I need to be doing. And well, you know, it's right now it's Tregear that gets my full uh, attention. And then Thule will, <laughs> I'm, I'm in discussions with Thule right now on a book four for the Benoit and Dane series. And uh, it's, it's trying to decide if this is the type of book that they're ready for. Um, Cause I, you know, touching on material, but I also know I have the right editor to help me make sure things stay on track with what I need to do. So yeah. um, I'd like to come up with another series for them, but I just don't know what it would be. I, I want, I want to spread out, but hopefully not spread myself so thin that, I don't have time and I run into burnout. So yeah, you're starting to sound like uh, Andrews and Wilson who have, you know, 
you know, they're trying to write three or four books a year. And I'm like, I interviewed them back in November and I was like, I don't know how you guys do this. Like, it seems like every other month you guys are coming out with another book and they're like, we just, every, every time we come up with an idea, man, we write it down and get it solidified. And it's another piece of intellectual property that we own and eventually just turns into something. And then I talked to them the other day and they're like, yeah, we have like 11 different projects in, in development for movies and TV. I was like, what? Yeah. And I've, yeah. Well, and I, um, so Thule has a good relationship with a lot of producers and stuff and they've had some of the romance books, you know, Hallmark or, you know, um, great American TV. They, hey, but all, yeah, all of my stuff does not qualify for that. It's too dark. And so, but they, they're still, they have those connections. And if I, you know, if I give them the AOK -okay to try, if they have somebody that's interested in something that I have, I just tell them, okay, try, you know, if they are interested, let me know. Um, in fact, our, our main acquisitions editor in Tergear just uh, changed her first book into a script. And so she's going to try and see if she can't run that on her own and see what it's like. So, and uh, Thule got my books into audio. So book one and book two of the Benoit and Dane series are audio and I, I, it's not pushed real hard, but I've had people say, I only listen to audio. Well, you're in luck here, yeah, you know, go, go get them. There's two of them. And I said here in about a year, book three will be out on audio too. So, um, yeah, I know some people that are like that too, that strictly listen to the audio because they just, they do it while they're working on the computer or while they're working out in the gym or whatever they may do but it's just audio. I don't, I don't drive that far to work, so I can't listen to an audio book. So an audio book that's 10 to 15 hours long, it will probably take me four months to listen to because I have a 10 minute drive to work. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I, like it's just, I, I wouldn't I get to a, half, a chapter in a day. Yeah. I have a half an hour drive to and from. Okay, and, so but that's usually when I'm listening to, um, I'll try to find music and that drive is just so mundane and it's so, auto i can sit there and i can think about okay this is what i need to do next series and you know the scene i usually write towards scenes that i've come up in my head with i don't write anything down because if i do then pff, it never gets done that's why i hate writing synopsis especially before the book's written um or I listen to true crime podcast. So I have like my three go-tos and then, but the only audiobooks I've ever listened to are my own. <laughs> so <laughs> and, and I'm glad I did because I caught a big old oops when I listened to the first one that I had in the second book. And I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> yeah. I changed a name that I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> well, whoops. I got it fixed though. Like, thankfully, when they were getting ready to record book two, um, I let one of the editors know. I said, the name is wrong. I said, it's only in there like twice. She's like, oh, we can change that. I'm like, yeah. thank you. Please Let's do, do this before someone catches me. Yeah. No, I don't <laughs> so, want to get an email from a, from a reader saying, you totally screwed up the whole series because of this name. I'm like, well, I didn't even read it. Yeah. I did. I, I when book two was going through the review process with all the reviewers, no one caught it. No one mentioned it. And I'm going, well, that's OK. That's fine. You know, big deal. Yeah. But we got it changed for the audiobook because I knew the narrator would catch it because she'll read it one way. And then as she gets going for wait a minute, you know, that's not what it's supposed to be. So. Um, and then. Yeah, I'm trying to do all this, and this is my daughter's last year um, showing as a junior exhibitor in cattle shows. So, and she's got a couple good calves, and I'm like, going, my weekends are shot from here until oh, yeah. August. Guys are busy. <laughs> you guys yeah, are busy. I know how that so, is. Yeah, but at least the nice thing is, is most of the shows that she goes to are local and i can take my stuff with me and if i'm not on camera duty or mom hold this mom hold this grab that calf or whatever because mm -hmm. if dad's there then dad can help too i can get stuff done and it's not like i haven't written in the back of the truck editing a book as we're driving to kansas city or something so yeah so uh before i let you go um let's uh let's let everybody know where they can find more about you so they can follow along 
get the newest scoop on these new releases. So, you know, drop your socials, your website, and what's coming up next. Okay, so website will eventually probably have to go through an update, but it's winteraustin.com. And, uh, but I spend most of my time on Instagram or Facebook. So you can find me on Instagram at IA Suspense Writer and Facebook, um, just Winter Austin um, on my Facebook page. I do have a Twitter account, but I don't really do much on it. It's just kind of left over from, you know, when you all had to be on every social platform. So, <laughs> but the only reason I'm on Twitter is if, uh, Iowa State is playing basketball or football, and I can't catch it on streaming or on TV. So that's my way to follow them. Um, but, and then, yeah, that's where I spend most of my time is Instagram and Facebook. And you can drop me an email anytime at uh, author.winderaustin at gmail.com. And I don't hear from my readers much except through Goodreads. That's how I, you know, I find out. So if people, It'd be nice to have a reader email <laughs> sent to me, but I don't get them very often. I've only had two in my entire career that I can remember. So most people contact you through Facebook. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Winter, it was an absolute pleasure. I wish you the best of luck with all these projects. I feel your pain. I'm trying to juggle a bunch as well. Um, but yeah, best of luck. And thank you so much for coming on. Yep. Thank you for having me.